thank you everybody uh, for attending today for the um, Spatial Analytics and Data Seminar Series uh, today. Uh, we're very grateful to host Laura Alessandretti. Um, she is a assistant professor at the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, and she'll be talking a little bit today about the um, research that she's done on aspects of human behavior uh, through the analysis of large scale data sets, particularly about um, sort of movement and spatial scales of human mobility. Uh, so thank you very much um, again. And before we start, uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to please submit questions using the Zoom Q&A functionality. Uh, we'll be able to monitor the chat as the talk goes on, but if you um, locate in the bottom of your screen, there'll be a Q&A button uh, and you'll be able to submit questions as the talk goes on. It's best to submit them when they arise rather than right at the end uh, so that other people attending the talk can upvote the questions and we can sort of help moderate them and spotlight them throughout the discussion at the end of the talk. So please do submit questions using the Q&A functionality during the talk. With that, I'll hand it over to Laura um, and we'll proceed with the talk. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for inviting me. I'm pleased to be here and very excited to talk about uh, my work on human mobility. Um, so uh, yes, let's just get to it. Um, I'm a physicist by background, but my interest lies in how people move. So I study human behavior using uh, large behavioral, behavioral data sets collected uh, using mobile phones. Um, and I will talk about one of my latest work uh, today. Uh, first of all, just a little quick background about why people study human movements. It's something that has been studied for a very long time since uh, the uh, since like 150 years. Uh, there's many good reasons why we want to be good at modeling mobility, because we want to better transport uh, plan transport, for example, or we want to forecast traffic. And as we all know right now, uh, because uh, disease spread to people and people move, then we want to be better at epidemic forecasting by understanding how people move. And ultimately, we also want to design better cities by understanding where people go and where people are. So this is sort of like reasons why I am interested in this topic. Now, when uh, I would like you to think for a second, if we we're not in the middle of a pandemic and we could do this seminar for real, uh, I would have to possibly travel from uh, Denmark, uh, where I live, uh, down to the UK to just give this seminar in person. And I would maybe travel to, to Bristol, uh, to the University of Bristol to get the seminar. And that means I would have to travel over like uh, 1,100 kilometers to get there. Or maybe I would have to go to the tour Institute in London and to get there I would need to travel 954 kilometers or maybe I would go to Newcastle University and that would be traveling around 900 kilometers but at the end of the day that wouldn't make much of a difference to me I would go to the UK anyways to give the seminar and it doesn't make much of a difference if I travel like a thousand kilometers or 900 kilometers or there's like a pretty big difference in terms of like how far the cities are um, however, if I had to say give the seminar, say like in Singapore or somewhere like on in another continent compared to Denmark, then maybe you know I would think it, about it twice, or it would be like a much more of a big deal for me. Um, so this is sort of uh, makes sense also at other scales. This is really how we think about mobility. So if we wanna go for a cup of coffee. Uh, we know that, and we are at the university, we know that this is something we can find at the university, within the university campus, and we, we will look for the closest, like, coffee yeah, within the university campus. We will maybe, like, look at a map of the campus, because that's the scale where we know we can find a coffee. If we had to find, like, a restaurant, then we'll probably, like, like look for it somewhere in our neighborhoods. And if we wanted to uh, go to, like, a stadium, then that's something we can find in our city. Uh, or if we wanted to, like, find an airport in our city then we know that like within the urban agglomeration we can find an airport and it doesn't really matter how far it is but it's in our urban agglomeration uh, and similar like as I said if we uh, wanted if we had like a conference in another country within our continent 
Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's in Italy or France. Uh, to me, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Um, and then, of course, we have the intercontinental scale. So really thinking in terms of scale is like uh, embedded in the way we think about space and we think about movements. And that has also been proven by cognitive scientists that have shown that we think of space in like hierarchical fashion, uh, where there's like different scales and levels. Uh, this is also like how many geographers, geographers have theorized sort of uh, uh, space. Uh, we really think of like the household and the neighborhood and the city, the country and so on. So uh, uh, here I, I took a quote uh, from like a, a paper in geography saying like different processes operate at different scales and must be studied accordingly. So this concept of like scale, it's, it's really embedded in the way like uh, geographers have theorized uh, mobility. Now in the last 20 years so, or so, there has been like a quantitative revolution in the way we can understand, characterize and model human mobility. And this is because all of a sudden we have like massive amount of data about how people move through mobile phones. So what has been found about mobility? Here, uh, I report some titles uh, that appeared in like very prestigious journals like Nature, Nature Physics in terms of like human mobility. And you can see that one of the predominant uh, like set of terms appearing is, is like scaling laws, scaling properties, scaling identities, scale free mobility. So many studies have found looking at empirical data that there are no scales in mobility. I would like to uh, say a little bit more about what that means. Uh, now, what you see here is sort of like uh, what we actually have when we look at data is like some uh, X, Y, T coordinates and some like uh, moving around. And we want to sort of like characterize trajectories. So something that people do is that uh, we look at some proper properties of these trajectories and some important properties are the length of the displacements and the duration of the stays so that the length of the displacement is like typically like how far we travel to go from one place to another and then how long do we stay there before going somewhere else now something that has been found by all these papers that I showed above is that when we look at the probability distribution describing the probability of traveling at a given distance uh, so it's a figure on the left. We see that this probability distribution is well described by what's called the power law distribution. And same thing for the probability of staying times, which is on the right of my screen. So uh, how long do we spend in a given place before moving out? What is the probability? Um, so especially in the tail, these distributions are well described by power laws. Now, power laws are uh, well known for being like scaling laws. So because they do not have a characteristic scale. And here you can see uh, 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 some formulas, but basically what, what I mean here is that when you scale the input of this function by a given value, so say here you have the probability of C times X, uh, that's pretty much uh, a constant times the probability of C of, C of X, uh, P of X. So it's, it's basically, a, there's no characteristic scale. Like we can look at this function um, at, for any value of x and the shape of the distribution is the same. Um, now there has been some level of controversy in the field in terms of like is a power law really well describing uh, the, the distributions of displacement lengths and stay, waiting times and there are different studies so here you can see an image where I try to summarize these different studies so each line is a study and the length of the line represents uh, how, uh, how many, like the range of distances they have focused on. And the, the orange set of studies are those that found power laws. And then some other studies found exponentials, not normals. But the power law uh, like uh, evidence is, is pretty clear, especially when it comes to like large scale displacements. So for uh, larger than 10 to the power of five meters. So really we can say that power laws, uh, distributions in mobility have been like the predominant um, sort of evidence. Uh, and in fact, the state of the art models that people use to describe how people move assume that there are scaling laws. So here 
uh, I kind of try to summarize what's called the exploration and preferential return in human mobility, which is like the state of the art model in mobility. And I will not go into the details of how this work. Uh, you can find it here in this paper, modeling the scaling properties of human mobility in nature physics. But you can see that the, po the power load distributions are sort of like key elements in this model. So basically uh, it's assumed that when a per person move, they will extract uh, a displacement length from these power load distributions. Now, as you can see, there's some kind of paradox here, right? So on the one hand, like the theory and the intuition suggests that there are scales surrounding us. We see space in this way and geography think of space in this way. And then when we look at data, we see no scales at all. How is this even possible? In fact, uh, it is not impossible. So uh, what happens? is that when you observe uh, processes occurring over different range of scales, um, the distribution uh, of, like of the aggregate mo movements appear to be scale free. So if you can read the quote here, what it says is like human activity processes have to occur over an en enormous range of scales. And each of these determines uh, the scale of build structures. But the distribution of substructures has to be scale free. I will try to go into the mathematical details of like how this is even possible that we have many scales, but we end up observing a power law. Let's take a distribution. If I manage. To... Yes, let's take a distribution that has a very uh, characteristic, a very uh, clear characteristic scale, like a Gaussian distribution. Now this has like a, a mean and has a standard deviation. So it does have a scale. Uh, now let's take six of them with different variances, so uh, um, different width uh, and different uh, averages. And then let's take a mixture of this power load is, uh, of these Gaussian distributions. Like lo let's look at the aggregation of all this distribution together. And let's maybe look at this in log log scale, which is typically what we do when we want to show power loads, because power loads appear clearly when we look at the data in log log scale. And let's keep adding distributions. So uh, let's go up to some like 50 distributions. And then we can clearly see that uh, the, the convolution or the aggregation of these different normal distributions uh, is actually a power law distribution. So uh, basically what it, mean, what, what it means is that even mathematically we can prove that when we put together uh, different scales and we aggregate different uh, levels of movements, we end up observing power laws. Now to show this even more clear, we have generated uh, in my team, like an interactive visualization. Maybe I can share it in, uh, in the chat, I can share the link. And basically you can play uh, with like different distributions and see that when you have a large number of distributions and you can play a bit with the parameters, you end up observing uh, power laws in log log scales. Um, I will share the link maybe later because now I'll go on with the rest of the presentation. So, okay, so this is clear that maybe this is actually the reason why we don't see scales, right? So there are lots of scales in our lives. There's like rooms, there's buildings, there's neighborhoods, there's cities and there's countries. So could it be that when we aggregate movements across these different hierarchical levels, we end up observing scale-free movements? Uh, if that's the case, then we need to find a way to unveil these like structures in, uh, in from human movements uh, because they're they are not so clear to see in the first place, and we need to design some system to see them. So this is what we did. We actually designed a new model of individual mobility that we call the container model. And the reason why we call it the container model is because it's based on this idea that there are there's like nested structures that contain our movements. So when we are within a room, we're kind of like contained within this room and we will wait some time before leaving it. So there is this nested structure of containers and this structure shapes the way we move because in a way, if uh, we need to go to a toilet, we will find the toilet in, our, in the buildings where we are before going to our favorite toilet at our, in our own place. So, this uh, structure sort of affect how we move and explore uh, the, spa the space. Our model has actually three elements. One is this hierarchical structure of places, 
Then we have what's called like, what we call the attractiveness of each container. So some container will be more important than others in our lives. So home is notably the most important container. Uh, and our home country is our most important container at the country level and so on. And then we have a set of probabilities of transitioning from between levels. How do people move? So now we have this model, we need to generate some traces. So this is a model that can, we can use to actually like generate some synthetic traces. What we do is that the, every time an individual has to choose where to go first, it will choose uh, at which level to transition. And then it will choose a destination based on the attractiveness. So of course, like home is the most uh, attractive place. So I'm likely to go back home if I am somewhere else uh, and so on. So we have these two elements, the probability of traveling at, give, at different levels and traveling um, across locations based on the set of attractivenesses. Now we have generated again, like uh, interactive visualization to show this model and how it works. So we can, we can really uh, think of it, of this like hierarchical structure in the simplest form, it's a grid. So here we can, uh, we can sort of play with the grid and say like, how many levels do we want? We want like five levels and how many uh, locations we want per level. And then uh, here we will generate a trace. And I think you can also animate it so that actually uh, the trace will sort of like appear uh, in real time. And I don't know if you've ever seen like actual trajectories, but uh, the trajectories that we generate using this uh, animated model are actually pretty similar to the trajectories that we observe uh, looking at uh, real world uh, data. They don't look too much uh, different. Uh, now, okay, for example, here you have an example of like a synthetic trace generated using our model. And as we can, and uh, on the left, you have the probability distribution where each displacement has been colored based on the level at which occurs. So we have blue uh, transitions, there are those between containers at the lowest hierarchical level and red transitions are those between between containers at the highest hierarchical level. Let's imagine for a second that we could only observe the gray trace but we couldn't observe color so we didn't know like at which level each transition is occurring. So maybe just to make sure everything is clear here on this trace I have colored at the beginning the displacements based on the uh, transition on the level at which they occur. So if two levels are between uh, like say rooms, so the lowest hierarchical level, then I have a blue transition. If two uh, transi transitions are between uh, buildings, then I have an orange transition and so on. But if when I when I look at real data, I will only see these like gray traces. So I don't see the colors. I don't know between which like uh, hierarchical levels these transitions occur. So the way I, yeah, uh, the way I would go back to sort of figuring out what's the hierarchical structure that generated this trace uh, is by looking at the candidate model. So I can only see a trace. I can only see like a sequence of locations and let's call them with letters. Uh, and let's say I have a candidate model that it's a potential model that has generated this trace. I can sort of compute what is the likelihood of this trace given the model. Uh, and basically the game would be like to find, given a gray trace, the game would be to find what is the model that has the highest likelihood. And sort of the hierarchical structure that is the most likely to have generated my trajectory. And this is the game we play, but using real world data. We don't use synthetic data anymore, we switch to real world data. So we have a very large scale data set that collects the trajectories of like 10, millions, uh, 10 million users uh, worldwide. Uh, it was uh, users that used a, a, an app installed on their phone and the data set covers uh, several years. So it started uh, until in 2015. Uh, it has a global coverage. So uh, individuals are located worldwide. It has very high temporal and spatial resolution and metadata. And then we also had other data set that we use to sort of corroborate our results, uh, data set collected uh, by the Copenhagen Network Study Experiment that was run uh, at DTU uh, by one of my collaborators, Sun Lehmann. Uh, and then we also have some like our own traces and traces of friends that we use for validation. 
So here it's actually a real world mobility trace um, and of someone who agreed to share uh, these figures uh, for the purpose of this uh, presentation. And we can see they are gray. So the, the trace is gray and the distribution of uh, displacement is gray because we don't know the hierarchical structure characterizing the movements of this person. What we do is that we optimize the likelihood and we optimize the likelihood one level at a time. So we find uh, for which value of container sizes we have uh, the minimum uh, negative likelihood and we can sort of like draw so the black dots are the locations of this person and we can draw sort of like this container around the locations of this person uh, and then we keep adding uh, levels uh, to sort of like group these locations together and build this like hierarchical structure until we cannot improve the likelihood anymore and so what we can do is that we can actually color uh, this trace and we can see um, we can see like the hierarchical structure underlying the displacements of this individual and what we can find here is just like an example for a, for a single person is the neighborhoods of this individual so at the lowest hierarchical level we have neighborhoods because we don't have enough spatial resolution to actually go down to rooms uh, and buildings at the second the hierarchical level we have uh, cities so this is actually copenhagen if uh, if you know Copenhagen, it's uh, uh, right by the sea. Uh, so orange containers are sort of like cities and there's like multiple cities around Copenhagen. Then green containers. So at the third level, we have this like urban agglomeration. So the area around Copenhagen and then like other agglomerations up in the north of, uh, of Denmark. And then at the fourth level, we start having like uh, regions and, uh, and countries. Um, I will also show you a sort of like more interactive uh, visualization where I can see the levels characterize the hierarchical structure characterizing, characterizing the movement of uh, this person. And you can see actually there's even like an upper level, which is the continents. Uh, now, the cool thing is that we can play this game for every single individual in our data set. Uh, and there's like millions of them. And we can find for each of them, like how many levels they, they have and what shapes do they have. And the first key finding is, is that uh, people have on average like four hierarchical levels. Uh, and this is like completely new compared to everything that people thought before where they uh, uh, understood mobility as being like scale-free when they analyzed actual data. We find that there's four levels in, uh, each in, in on average in individuals mobility. And then we find that there are what we call characteristic scales across the population, which means that when we plot the distribution of sizes of these containers, we find that they do have some typical size. In terms of space, so the first level has approximately like the size of like some kilometers and people spend less than a day typically within these containers. At the second level, we have approximately like 30 kilometers uh, on average, and people spend um, spend typically around a day within these uh, locations with, of course, large variations. Uh, the third scales container have approximately like 100 kilometer size, and people spend more than a day typically within these containers, and so on and so forth. We can go up to the fifth and sixth um, level uh, of um, hierarchical structure. Now, why is this important? Like now we have like a better a system to sort of like, like unveil this structure from, uh, from tra trajectories of people. Uh, why is this important? Why do we care? Uh, there may be like many, many reasons, but I can start with some. So first of all is that we have a new model and with this model, we can generate more realistic traces. And I would like to show you that this is the case. So what we did is that we, uh, used a sort of like machine learning approach where we trained our model using like one year of data for each, each individual. And then we generated some new movements, some kind of like, I take a year of my own data and I generate like the next 50 movements. Where will I go next? Using this like hierarchical uh, model. And then what I do is that I compare the properties of these like synthetic 50 movements uh, that are fake and the actual movements because we have those and we can see like how similar they are 
And what we can see is that basically when we use our container model to generate these synthetic trajectories, we are much better than uh, the state-of-the-art models at this, at sort of um, uh, at generating synthetic traces. So here what you can see is that probability distribution of displacement lens, something we have seen before. And the orange line is our model. The black line is actual data and the blue line is the EPR model. So it's a state of the art model. And you can see like we match much better uh, the actual data compared to uh, the EPR model. And then we can look at other properties. So this was the probability distribution of displacements, but we also can see, for example, the evolution of the radius of gyration over time. The radius of gyration, which is defined uh, at the bottom of the slide, is sort of a measure of how big our individuals were about. Um, and this is something that people have looked at in, in the literature in human mobility. Uh, and we can see again that the orange line matches much better the blue line in terms of uh, describing this curve. Same with the frequency of visitation for different locations. Uh, we have, this is another quantity that people have looked at, how, uh, how much how many times we visit a given location based on its rank. Again, the orange model, the container model, uh, works much better than previous model. And we, can, we also looked at the entropy, which is sort of a measure of like how predictable are uh, individual trajectories. And in particular, you can compare what's called the uncorrelated entropy with a temporal entropy, uh, which is something uh, described in this famous paper, limits of predictability in human mobility. Uh, and we can see again, uh, traces are, more predictable uh, than uh, than uh, the EPR model would expect would uh, would sort of predict. So, and the orange line again uh, matches much better the actual data than than the EPR model did. So, we have evidence that the container model outperforms the state of the art in terms of like describing uh, uh, data and also generating synthetic uh, trajectories. And we have actually compared with many other models. So there are sort of variations of this like EPR model that was a state of the art. And we can see that against all these different models, the container model performs much better. A second reason why uh, we care about this and this model is important is because it helps us understand some heterogeneities across individuals, some differences between people. And to give some examples, uh, I would like to address first the gender gap. So differences between uh, females and males. Uh, we have that when we look at the size of these containers, uh, here you have the average size of containers for a different uh, scales for females and males. And you can see that females sizes are smaller. So typically women uh, travel uh, less. Uh, so their containers have like a sh smaller extent. However, we find that uh, typically uh, women have more hierarchical levels compared to men. So in a way, although their uh, mobility is more confined, it's also more complex. So it is described by a more like hierarchical structure. Why is that and what does this mean? We would have to look into that, uh, we don't know, but um, it unveils some differences. And in fact, when we look at differences across countries, we can see that this helps us uh, see some actual differences. So here you have the distribution of the number of scales or of levels for uh, males and females. So the red curve is females and the blue curve is males in different countries. And on the left column, you have those countries where the difference is more pronounced, which are Saudi Arabia, India, uh, United Arab Emirates and Turkey. And on the right column, you have those countries where the difference is less pronounced, which is Norway, Denmark, Switzerland and Ireland. And actually when we plot there's a difference against what's called the gender inequality index, which has nothing to do with mobility. Uh, it's computed uh, using other types of data, such, such as like, that measure the gender equality in a given country. We find that there's an actual correlation. So the larger the inequality and the larger the difference we observe in terms of like how uh, mobility of males and women is structured. And further, we can look at some other examples such as the urban rural gap. So there are differences in mobility between men and uh, between people living in cities and outside cities, and we, as we know. Uh, and in fact, when we run this model uh, for people living in the countryside, typically what we show is that they have much larger containers because, uh, because uh, potentially uh, 
what they need to access is not as close uh, as it is for people living in cities. And therefore, you can see on the left column, there's a people living in the country, a person living in the countryside in Denmark. In the right column, there's a person living in, in the city in Denmark, and they're on the same scale. Uh, and you can see that uh, the container for the left uh, user are, are much larger. And this is reflected if I, when we see, when we look at the distribution, we can see like a clear difference between the size of containers in urban and rural users. And finally, another point is the effect of uh, walkability. So walkability is, uh, is an index that measures is the characteristic of uh, the environment that contribute to pedestrian friendly neighborhoods. Uh, so areas that are uh, highly walkable are typically areas where there's like shops and there's like pedestrian uh, streets and so on. And areas that are not really walkable are areas where there's, there are no shops and uh, uh, they are more like meant to be for cars and so on. And, and what we can see is that again, this is an effect on the size of these uh, containers. So for individuals whose home location is located in a uh, highly walkable area, then the size of their containers, uh, especially at the lowest level, is, is small. Instead, when the walkability um, is really, uh, it, when places are not walkable, then the size of the containers is, is really large. So that also sort of matches with uh, what we saw before uh, for urban and rural uh, users. So to sum up, uh, I'm not sure I am on time, but uh, I'll, I will sum up. Uh, human mobility is characterized by spatial scales and we have, uh, we're able to unveil these spatial scales uh, using our container model. Um, our work helps understand different aspects of human mobility and to generate realistic synthetic trajectories. If you want to know more about this paper, uh, about this work, there is an upcoming paper that is coming out tomorrow in Nature. So uh, you can read more about it tomorrow. It's actually very timely that I could speak about this today. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, you can uh, follow me. You, you can find it in Nature or if you follow me in Twitter, I will advertise it. This work was done in collaboration with Sune uh, from the Technical University of Denmark and Ulf uh, from the University of Copenhagen and Technical University of Denmark. I would really like to thank you for being here. Uh, I could not see you uh, in the screen, uh, but uh, I, I would have loved to. <laughs> and uh, you, you're really welcome to ask me any question uh, right now, or also uh, just write me a message or an email later on. Here I also put some papers that I've worked on previously if you're interested in my in my work. Thank you very much and thanks the organizers uh, for uh, making the effort to organize this, this very interesting uh, series of seminars. Wonderful, thanks. Um, if you'd like to stop the screen share now, yes. then we can put up the, the panel. That was an excellent talk. It's generated a lot of questions. Um, I think that kind of synthesizing across um, a couple of different questions. Uh, a few people have raised, um, such as SB's question, one main challenge with human mobility modeling is access to relevant data sets. Are there any useful open source data sets we can use to more thoroughly study mobility besides Google and Apple mobility data sets, which are not exhaustive? Um, another person asked sort of specifically about your kind of 10 million trace data set. Uh, so if you can speak a little bit more to kind of open mobility data, what you're using, what people might use, that would be great. Yes, uh, so I'm not aware of many uh, open source mobility, individual mobility data sets. Uh, so there's one called GeoLife uh, that has been collected in China some years ago, maybe like in 2010 or something, uh, that's uh, publicly available. So typically that's like a very good way to start testing uh, models and so on because it, it's, it's public. Um, other than that, I'm not aware of any publicly available data sets consisting of individual level traces. There's other publicly available data sets that consist of like collective or aggregated movements. Uh, and for those, 
uh, there's a couple. I am not sure how I can share links, but there's one that was collected by the Telecom Challenge uh, in Italy. And we're also going to release one actually that we collected in Denmark uh, during Corona, uh, use, like fr from mobile phone operators. But that's like aggregated at the level of the day. And typically there's some also some kind of special aggregation. In our cases at the level of the commune. Um, yes, and in terms of like our data set or the one we use here, we collaborated with a global uh, technology company uh, and smartphone manufacturer. Uh, and we, obtain, we, we collaborated with them uh, and the research team. And that's uh, how we got this data set. But uh, it's, we cannot share it nor disclose the name of the company. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. Anyway. That's his Thank answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's the, yeah, no, that's about as good as we're going to get, I think. <laughs> yes, and actually, I also have to say that uh, there is another data that we use, which is the data collected by the Copenhagen Network Study Experiment uh, in 2013, 2015. Uh, and that's something that uh, we have at DTU, and we're open to collaborations. If uh, anyone is interested in working with mobility data, uh, we can we can talk. It was not collected by me, but it was collected by by the team where I work right now. Sure. Yeah. Um, thanks. I'm sure that that'll answer many people's questions in the in the chat. We have uh, quite a few questions pertaining to or kind of interested in uh, the research you had presented on the gender uh, gaps in uh, mobility. So um, just picking out possibly one of those. Um, it might be something like uh, regarding the difference between sort of men and women. Uh, women in Western countries tend to have more multi-purpose trips, uh, whereas you know men might have sort of longer trips. Can you speak to kind of not only just the distribution, but then also kind of the, as you would say, like the hierarchy of those structures? Um, maybe that would speak to, I think folks are interested in very much about that kind of uh, neighborhood size and then also structure of trip distributions. I have to say that I have not looked uh, into that, like into multiple purpose uh, trips, but that's a very good idea. So of course, like one of the next steps would be to sort of like assign some semantics to the different locations that are visited. And they're like trying to figure out more about these differences by looking at the semantics. And this is a very good suggestion that um, while men uh, are like could be in some places, they are more uh, present in the workforce and therefore the commute, the, like the mobility is highly dominated by commuting, while uh, for females there could be uh, this uh, effect of uh, traveling between like different locations with different semantics. Uh, and I bet that would be something very interesting to look at, but I haven't yet. So I cannot really uh, say anything more than what I've shown, uh, which is that there are these differences in sizes. Sure, sure. Uh, actually, we have looked at gender gaps uh, in general in mobility, uh, and we can see that some of the aspects that contribute to these differences are the perception of safety. So women tend to travel less, uh, especially at night, because due to the perception of safety, uh, uh, and uh, also, yeah, again, the presence in the workforce that makes a difference, uh, and also familiar responsibilities. Uh, so that's also something that uh, makes a big difference. Cool, thanks. I'm sure that that'll answer a couple of the questions that have floated up about the the um, sort of gender gaps and the way that trips are constructed in addition to their distance and size distributions. Um, I have one question from Jorge Gill asking, uh, super interesting work. Uh, are these sort of containers that you're deriving for people somehow related to the concepts of kind of space-time prisons uh, coming from sort of geographers like Har Harvey Miller or I guess earlier than that, Torsten Hagerstrand? Are you familiar with that body of work in the in the kind of space time prism analysis? And it's not a community where I come from, but I, I tried to read a bit <laughs> <laughs> when I was uh, and and we definitely realized that there were many similarities between this work and uh, and some theories like the central place theory in geography and so on. And, and this is and this is why we thought this was even more important, uh, precisely because uh, this uh, this theories uh, and ideas in geography were were kind of like not uh, reflected now in empirical understanding we have uh, of mobility. So there was really like a, a tension there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so for sure, all the, 
the papers and literature you've, you've mentioned are, are very relevant uh, in terms of like this work. Yeah, I think there was also actually another question about that kind of the, the containers and their relationship to central place theory uh, and then kind of like how that structure may also indeed be uh, something where um, we're looking for sort of scale free properties. Do you have any sort of interpretation of your work in that kind of central place uh, literature or? Uh, as far as I uh, know, that also, um, I mean, there's, there's a difference here because here we have like individual sort of uh, hierarchical structure. And I think in that type of theory, it's more like a, a, at a global or collective level. Uh, and in a way, now we would really like to, uh, to explore this and see like what happens when we aggregate containers across individuals. Can we find some kind of like collective or global uh, hierarchical structures of place? Uh, are we able to sort of provide new definitions of neighborhoods and cities based on uh, the actual movements of people when we like aggregate them together? Uh, uh, and it's something that goes a little bit in, in that direction. Uh, and again, it's, it's something we'll do in the future. We haven't really tackled this now. Sure. One question I would have with that kind of um, that kind of work is that in a lot of these mobility data sets, there are uh, sort of issues of non-representativeness, especially when you're working with sort of volunteer samples. And uh, although I don't know the structure of your your uh, large technology company uh, data set, um, one might assume that there can be systematic bias in, in those things too. Uh, and there's some pretty good work in sociology that suggests that individuals kind of stick to communities which they are socio-demographically aligned with. How do you see sort of the, the fact that these traces are really rich, but sort of demographically and contextually poor? How, how do you get around that kind of division in, in the kind of data that you're analyzing? Where does the sort of socioeconomic center? Yes, I mean, uh, totally uh, a good point. Um, smartphones are pretty pervasive, uh, although I, uh, I see that when smartphones come from like specific companies and of course they're not like 100% pervasive. So uh, typically we have like a better understanding of what happens like in, in, in Western uh, countries um where uh, they're more pervasive or in some specific countries where this specific company is more uh, present uh, so for sure that's a problem and this is also the reason why we looked at two different data sets and of course uh, they, they do not uh, represent like the entire uh, world population but at least we have some evidence that our uh, model works well for two different data sets that are collected in completely different settings um and therefore we we, we feel safe that, that this is actually describing really well in general uh of course i would love to have more data sets to uh, to test this this model with but it's it's generally harder to to collect data in certain specific uh socioeconomic contexts of course of course cool um we also have a question coming about oh would you like to go rachel well, I was just thinking about your your answer just now, Laura, and I had been thinking through your presentation how interesting it is to start from sort of social science theory on movement or to start from data and then get to theory. So you have, you could almost imagine different disciplines starting in a different end of a line and then they sort of crawl their way towards each other. But an interesting thing about mobility, I think whether it's sort of short distance sort of within urban areas or longer distance sort of migration is that we're relying on the traditional data to give us the characteristics. So you have traces. And if we wanted to back into, for example, like where Levi was leaning towards thinking about segregation and patterns of interaction inside of a city, to do that, we can't, we can't get to it without recourse to traditional administrative level data that tell us who who lives in which parts of the city and then we could maybe hypothesize a link between origin and destination and characteristics of places and so i wonder if you have thoughts about what we're going to do when i think what we really want to be able to do is say something about short and longer distance I mean, as a as a population geographer, I think mobility is in, is super scaled, right? I think they've got these processes that are stacked on top of, top of each other, and 
international migration is just as important as sort of intra-urban mobility or inter-urban mobility. Um, but how are we going to get to that with sort of emerging data sources without, without reliance on the traditional administrative level, say survey or census data that we use to derive meaning from these things? What's the path forward? Well, I mean, going back to the question of segregation, I think like this uh, method uh, we have individual trajectories collected in phones is it would be like a, a super good starting point because we could precisely like look at like overlaps between like people like whereabouts. And if we had some like metadata and additional information about uh, about like individual characteristics and so on, for sure, we could tackle like those questions without the need to actually like going and ask people. Then of course, it's a different question. Uh, why? Why are people segregated? Like, is there any reason? And, and for that, uh, uh, maybe, maybe we, we do need to have some kind of like, we do need to collaborate uh, the social scientists and the uh, this like data science approach where what we can do is sort of like, uh, we, we can observe, we can, we can describe, we can model, we can predict, we can forecast, uh, but maybe it's harder to get to the, to, to the why. Uh, and for that, I'm sure that like the, the integration of like all types of data yeah. sources would, would provide the answer. It, was, it wasn't a critical question. It was an observation that as, that I think one of the reasons that we are uh, entranced sort of an interdisciplinary um, um, charm of say mobility data and trace data is it allows us to do things we couldn't do before. So everyone is interested in that. That's a pull factor, but we have a push factor, which is that traditional ways of collecting socioeconomic and demographic data, they start to be less reliable for us. So people are more resistant to responding to a decennial census. They're less willing to give their information. They tear up the surveys when they come in the mail. They don't pick up their phones to answer the surveys. And so that fabric that we base a lot of our social science understanding on, that starts to fray a little bit in lots of places. And so how are we going to fill that gap if it starts to become larger? That's, that's, so that was sort of my question. It, there was okay, no, okay. there's no right or wrong. It's more <laughs> that, um, I think there are push and pull factors and we don't often talk about the push factors, the ones that are making us look for new data and new ways of understanding the world because the old ways of understanding the world um, become maybe a little bit problematic for us. I mean, of course, uh, of course it requires more like involvement and like individuals have to ask questionnaires and, they <laughs> and, uh, and that takes time. Uh, I, I bet they, they need like some incentives in terms of like understanding what is this like used for uh, and uh, yeah sort of like making sure that like th there is an understanding that these methods are, are, are still important and needed and we cannot just simply rely on passively collected data uh, because science like still needs uh, sir, like people to answer surveys and questionnaires to actually be able to, tr to train and understand uh, the more uh, passively collected data sources. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I think there are other questions that Levi was pointing I, I mean, I'm just, I'm happy to, to facilitate that discussion. There's also just a lot of, of questions coming in the chat as well. So um, I, one that I would like to uh, kind of make sure gets asked is um, uh, Michael Van Mutten's question about um, sort of the scale at which these containers are, are drawn. So he asks about sort of the fact that you've, in your sort of maps of these places, you're kind of drawing what looked like maybe a convex hull around the edges of a particular, you know, box of activity sets. Um, and his question is sort of, how do you deal with the fact that it, oftentimes these might actually have holes inside of them where the individual actually sort of stays in a particular area, but doesn't enter a particular exclusion zone, which I think gets to our questions of kind of segregation and, and an interest in, in that. So, so how do you deal with that kind of thing, if at all? Very good point, <laughs> uh, very good point. But this is, this is sort of like how uh, we have structured uh, the model. So we have, this, um, we have these containers that are our convex hulls. So they don't have like holes uh, in them. And, uh, and this is sort 
like one of the assumptions of, of the model. But one can see that, uh, especially when it comes to like the lowest hierarchical levels, locations are pretty compact, and it's uh, it's a fairly like it's a realistic assumption to to say that uh, they can be like well described by like a compact convex hull. Sure, sure, cool. Um, and then we also have a, a an additional question about sort of the sort of climactic seasonal variability. Uh, do you think that there are sort of strong effects from that, or do behaviors and scales kind of remain the same regardless of your kind of environment uh, in a naturalistic sense? That's a very interesting point. We haven't looked into that yet, uh, but that would definitely be something that is worth looking at. And uh, I'm sure that there would be some some changes. So now we look at like pretty long time scales. So say like the level of like we have to for like a year. So probably we cancel out some of these variations. But if one looked at like short time scales for sure, uh, I'm, I'm sure we, we could see some difference across the years. Our point was really to sort of grasp uh, the, the entirety of uh, an individual sort of like daily lives and like yearly lives by looking at like long trajectories. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm sure there would be like something interesting coming out uh, since we can look both at like shorter time scales, but also like longer time scales if there's like evolutions over uh, years. Yeah, I think the question is also sort of in the same vein that you were doing these sort of region or country based comparisons in the gender uh, context. Yeah. It might also be interesting to think of, you know, regional or place based comparisons based on kind of climactic differentiation. And I, I think that that was what the question was getting at, which yes. maybe is just a suggestion for further research rather than it's a very good suggestion. <laughs> anything it's else. A very, it's a very good one. Wonderful. Well, um, I think that that's about all that's been put into the, uh, the chat. So if there's any other kinds of points that people have or questions, make sure to ask them now. Or if there's anything, Rachel, that you'd love to follow up on, that's cool. No, I would just really like to thank you for such a nice talk and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It was a very nice audience and lots of nice questions. Yeah. That's a very very yes, nice. Again, just thank for, for organizing this. Uh, it's, it was really a pleasure to be here and also uh, to, to get uh, different questions and things to think about for the next steps. So. Wonderful. Well, thanks a lot. I think um, with that, uh, oh wait, there's one last question that we might want to ask and then we'll probably close. So again, from Jorge Gill, uh, how do you reconcile the container model with the fact that people generally move along networks? So kind of their routes or uh, positions are constrained. These also have a hierarchy. So in the multi-scale mobility model, um, do you kind of have a way to deal with that? Yes, so the, the great example that I showed uh, was sort of like a, just a simplistic uh, model, uh, but we actually don't use the grid model uh, to, to fit real world data. We use the grid model just to sort of like show uh, like how it works approximately, but then we don't use the actual uh, grid model. Like our code to, uh, to extract hierarchies from individual traces is available online so everyone can use it. Uh, and you can see that it's much more complex than that. It's not simply a grid. Uh, but then we don't really take into account uh, distances along street network. So we take into account like just the, the simple like have sign distance between any two locations as sort of like uh, the distance between uh, two locations. So we don't, we don't really like embed networks. But I, I think it would be again like interesting to see uh, whether there's any like uh, how does the street network affect the containers that we observe. So for sure, it, it must have some, it must play some role. Uh, and we haven't looked into that. I know that in the um, spatial optimization and planning literature, there are kind of divided results about whether or not it actually matters to measure your distances in terms of street networks or in terms of, you know, straight line or Haverstein distance. And also that it depends on the context in which the route is taken so that you know, in places where connectivity is really good, it doesn't matter. But in places where connectivity is poor, your straight line distance is a bad approximation to the network distance. So it is an interesting result with theoretically important implications, I think. Yes, yes. For sure. Well, cool. I think with that, we'll, we'll call it to a close because we're about to hit time. But um, really, really appreciate the talk. It was absolutely wonderful having you. Um, and
uh, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, the next talk um, is, let me pull it up, is going to be rather soon. Uh, and it's with uh, Cleo Andrus uh, at Georgia Tech. And she'll be talking about analyzing interpersonal ties and social networks using GIS. Uh, it'll be uh, in a bit. Um, it's not immediately the next talk. We have a break for our American attendees that will be in Thanksgiving uh, next week. Uh, but then the week after that, we'll have uh, this next talk sort of in the similar vein on networks and geography. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, we're really glad to host everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.